everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, we are going to be talking about the nervous system again today. This is part three of our series, and we are going to start out by talking about the limbic system. So the limbic system is associated with those higher uh, mental functions, uh, your emotions, and uh, they basically uh, blend together your, your feelings of rage, of anger, of joy, of happiness, of sadness. And they also blend together that with reasoning and your memory and united into one whole um, unit. So your limbic system involves your hypothalamus, your thalamus, your amygdala, and your hippocampus. And it explains why certain activities are pleasurable and why mental stress can cause you to have high blood pressure. So the limbic system is this complex net, um, network of tracts and nuclei within the brain, and it incorporates parts of your cerebral uh, lobes and your basal nuclei, as well as the diencephalon. Uh, the hippocampus, which is located right here, um, here, let me move myself up out of the way so you have orientation here. Here's the corpus callosum. Remember, that's what um, connects the right and the left hemispheres of the brain together. Okay, here's your thalamus. Here's your pituitary gland. Okay, and uh, so your hippocampus is lying right here. This is part of your ventricles right here. So here's your lateral ventricles and um, your third ventricle. And uh, the job of the hippocampus is, is to communicate with the prefrontal area of the brain. Right anterior to the hippocampus is the amygdala, and it allows us to respond and display anger and avoidance and defensiveness and ah, scary and fear. And uh, its job is to just promote uh, the release of adrenaline so that you are having an appropriate response to various situations. Uh, the human cerebrum is responsible for those higher memory functions or mental functions that are associated with uh, memory and learning, and that would include your language and your speech. And we've talked in our previous section about the cerebrum and the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe. We talked about those association centers. We talked about um, those communication centers. And you should be pretty familiar by now of where those uh, centers are and their uh, roles in our higher mental function. Okay, so the limbic system indicates that there are particular areas called cortical, cortical areas that may work with lower centers to produce memory and learning. So what is memory? Memory is the ability to hold on to or to recall a piece of information that happened or occurred in the past. Um, as simple as a word learned a day ago um, to something that maybe you learned when you were five years old or some kind of emotional experience that shapes who you are and why you maybe act or respond the way you do to certain situations. Learning is the ability to retain and apply past memories. And that's what you're doing in class, by the way. So types of memory. We have short-term memory and we have long-term memory. Short-term memory are those things that we memorize for a very short period of time. Like if somebody tells you their phone number is 760, blah, 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 you might be able to remember it uh, short enough that you can punch it into your phone and then you can call them or or you add that to your phone now. Uh, this depends on the prefrontal area and which part of your prefrontal um, area is currently active. Long-term memory, this is um, the type of memory that's retained for long periods of time, sometimes for your entire lifetime. And it is a mixture of what is called semantic memory. And these are ideas or concepts or meanings like words or phone numbers. I mean, I remember my phone number clear back from second grade. And I don't know how long it's been since my parents have not had that phone number, but it's embedded in my memory. Shoot, I remember my grandfather's phone number, but I do not know my husband's phone number right now because all I have to do is pick up a button and go, husband, and I get it. 
Um, episodic memory, um, where you memorize or you remember specific events or specific facts or even specific people. And then there's skilled memory. Skilled memory is independent of episodic memory. It involves doing things like riding a bike. Um, it requires fewer areas of your cerebral cortex once that skill is perfected. Some of you have heard of muscle memory. If you do something over and over and over, then pretty soon you'll just be able to do it, like riding a bike. If you think about how hard it was to ride a bike initially, you really had to work at it. You really had to think about it. Now you get on a bike. I mean, I hadn't been on a bike in like 20 years, and I bought myself a new bike a couple summers ago and was a little scared, but boom muscle memory got back on. It's a skill that is still retained. Um, it involves all motor areas of the cerebrum below the level of consciousness. So I can get on a bike and ride it and I don't have to really think about it at all. Mostly I just think about the cars that might hit me. Just saying. All right, so long-term memory and memory retrieval. Um, memory and stored bits of information or pieces of information are stored in association areas. So in your visual association area, you're going to show uh, store information about visions. Like maybe you can remember what your great grandma looked like, or, or maybe you can remember what uh, something that really impressed you, like maybe this mountain range behind me. Um, stored sounds, you know, certain sounds either scare you or they make you happy or they make you sad. Um, those would be stored in the auditor auditory association area. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that's going to pull all of those events together and allow us to recall them as a single event. I mean, you might remember how beautiful those mountains look, and then you might recall the beautiful sounds of the birds or, or the calmness of the water, and you put that all together and it becomes a memory. Hippocampus is also involved in converting short-term memories into long-term memories. So why are some memories emotionally charged? Well, if you think about it, you have all these association areas that are collecting that information, and then you are associating those memories with certain stimuli. The amygdala uh, is responsible for fear conditioning, and it associates danger with certain stimuli, sensory stimuli, that are received from both the di diencephalon and the cortical sensory areas that say, hey, if somebody's you know um, holding a knife in front of your face, you remember that, you know, maybe you saw something on TV or you saw a, a horrible event and you recall, hey, last time somebody held the knife up, you know, that person didn't move. I better move. And um, sometimes those memories can become very emotionally charged. It could be somebody that has passed away. It could be the birth of your child. It could be um, your first day of school, your first day of college, your first day of high school. Um, language and speech are also um, controlled by our brain. Language is dependent upon semantic memory. So uh, seeing and hearing words, and you know that as a child, the more you see words, the more you remember them. The more you hear those words, the quicker you and can see and hear and remember those words in context. Uh, the seeing and hearing of words is dependent upon your visual cortex. So the words are seen in your occipital lobe by your visual cortex. Um, your information concerning the word is processed in the Wernicke's area of your brain. And then that information is transferred towards the frontal part of your brain where the Broca's area is. And it is um, going to be transformed or processed as a motor response in which now you're taking uh, that interpretation that you interpreted in the Wernicke's area and you are transforming that into your speech or those spoken words. Um, so seeing and hearing words dependent upon the primary visual co cortex and the occipital lobe and also is dependent upon the auditory, that hearing part that we hear here in the auditory complex or cortex um, in your temporal lobe. Speaking words then is in the um, um, 
Broca's area that's in the frontal lobe. And those are motor centers that are sending out um, the motor uh, impulses or motor responses that are allowing me to form those words and speak those words. And um, these are all what are called PET scans uh, of the brain that are showing you which parts of the brain are most active. And those would be the red, yellow areas are most active when you are processing speech. All right, so the left and the right uh, cerebral hem hemispheres have different functions that are related to language and speech. It's interesting because the Broca's and the Wernicke areas are only located in the left hemisphere, which is pretty handy. If and, and one thing you can remember, if you look at, you know, go on Google and pull up an image of the brain, almost 90% of the time, they will always be showing you a picture that shows the left side of the brain because the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area are only seen or they are only um, present in the left hemisphere. So if you were trying to label a drawing, you would want to show the left hemisphere. Um, so the Broca's again is in the frontal lobe and it's responsible for speech. And the Wernicke's area is, um, um, in the temporal area um, that is responsible for processing and comprehending speech and putting that all together so that when the motor response is sent out by the Broca's area, you have, you know, if I'm asking you, is the sky blue or yellow today? Well, you need to process that in the Wernicke's area. And then your response is going to be from the Broca's area where you're going to say, oh, it's really blue today. Um, both hemispheres are going to process the information, but they're going to process it a little bit differently. The left side of the brain tends to process information that is very specific, that verbal information, the logical information, the rational information, and part of that is related to the Wernicke's and the Broca's area. The right side of the brain is going to be a little bit, oh, well, it's going to be very global, and it's going to be... Um, processing information that is those nonverbal cues, the intuitive, the creative um, information. All right, so um, now we're moving into um, some effects that different um, disorders, diseases, and drugs can have on the nervous system. And we'll start out with drug abuse here. A wide variety of drugs are, will affect the nervous system. We talked about cocaine a little bit earlier in the first lecture. And some of these drugs, not only are they affecting the nervous system, but they are affecting the limbic system and they are altering your moods and your emotional states. Um, oftentimes the first time somebody tries a drug such as nicotine or alcohol or cocaine, that person experiences feelings of pleasure. They feel good. And then they want to keep using it because they want those good feelings again. However, when somebody continues to use some of these drugs, they develop a tolerance and a physical or psychological dependence may also develop. Um, and a user may have great difficulty quitting due to these intense cravings. Now, it's it's all in your brain chemistry and it has a lot to do with how those receptors on the postsynaptic postsynaptic um, neuron are responding to these drugs. Many illicit drugs are affecting those synapses. Stimulants, um, they will excite those neurons and cause those neurons to fire. Depressants decrease that excitation and will stop neurons from responding. Dopamine, as we saw in cocaine, um, is one neurotransmitter that's involved with physical dependence, that addiction. Because remember, those receptors become blocked with dopamine and, and are sending that response. And normally, dopamine would trigger an action potential in the next neuron, and they would normally be recycled into the presynaptic uh, neuron. But what happens is if a drug like cocaine blocks the um, recycling mechanism of dopamine, then that dopamine um, increases in the synapse and it increases that feeling of pleasure. And um, that can create a, a, a 
a moment of, or not a moment, it can create dependence, okay? So um, cocaine, when we say potentiates or potentiates the effects of dopamine, it's enhancing it and, uh, and uh, could cause dependence. And this is just looking at that uh, drug abuse one more time. Um, here's our neurotransmitters. Remember when a nerve impulse or an actual potential reaches the end of the axon terminal, calcium gates open and calcium gates trigger the synaptic vesicles that are carrying the um, neurotransmitters to the presynaptic membrane where they'll fuse and then through exocytosis they'll release those neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft and normally they will then bond with the receptors and um, um, trigger that action potential in the next neuron and then these neurotransmitters will be uh, returned and recycled in the presynaptic neurons so there are a number of drug actions that can take place that can interfere with the natural um, neurotransmitters and how they send on their action potentials. Um, drugs can interfere by causing the release of a neurotransmitter from a synaptic vessel into the axon terminal, but in doing so, those drugs could also prevent the release of the neurotransmitter. They could promote the release of the neurotransmitter. They could prevent the uptake of the neurotransmitter back into the presynapse. They could block the enzymatic breakdown of those neurotransmitters, or they could actually mimic uh, the action of neurotransmitter and actually bind themselves into the receptor site on the post-synaptic um, neuron. Okay, so another example of a drug that affects the nervous system is nicotine. Nicotine, as you know, is found in tobacco products like cigarettes, uh, chewing tobacco. And when you take in nicotine, it causes the release of a hormone called epinephrine. And what epinephrine does initially is it raises blood sugars. And then, and some of you have heard of that, you, you feel really good and then you crash. And that crash is your actual blood sugars that are falling and then depression and fatigue set in and oftentimes then that signals somebody to go have another smoke okay in the cns or the central nervous system what smoking does or these tobacco products does is it causes the release of dopamine and so dopamine um, will be released into that synaptic cleft and uh, it will bind to the receptor sites here but what happens then is those dopamine transporters, um, they will get blocked by the nicotine and uh, that dopamine can't get back. And so um, what will happen then is that dopamine again will build up in that synaptic cleft and give you that feel good feeling until um, you have that crash and your blood sugars fall. And this is what causes both a physiological and a psychological dependence on nicotine. All right, so alcohol um, or ethanol, which is found in alcohol, influences um, some inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters called uh, GABA or GABA and other neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And uh, these drugs are metabolized in the liver. But what happens is alcohol actually prevents the liver from um, breaking down fats. And so as a result, fat deposits start accumulating in the liver and that's where you start seeing fibrosis those are fatty deposits and uh, this is one of the first stages of liver damage um, and this fat actually starts accumulating after only one night of drinking this is reversible you stop drinking and you can heal your liver and uh, but if you don't stop drinking long time usage can actually lead to what is called cirrhosis of the liver and during cirrhosis of the liver not only do you have this buildup of fat accumulations but you have liver cells that are now starting to die and at that point in time your liver damage is irreversible um, sometimes people also get cancer of the liver um, as an additional stage or it, it could occur due to another event but these are the first three stages due to alcohol dependency so you, you don't want to go there you destroy your liver you are destroying your health 
So alcohol is a carbohydrate and uh, alcohol can be used as an energy source. That's what gives you that I feel good type feeling, but it lacks vitamins. It lacks minerals. It lacks essential acid, amino acids that are building proteins. It lacks fatty acids. So alcohol is vitamin deficient. Um, it doesn't provide any nourishment. And as a result, people that, uh, um, our alcoholics are prone to illness. That alcohol, um, in the case of a pregnant woman, a woman can also cross the placenta and it can cause something called FAS or the fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, it can lead to mental retardation and it can lead to a number of physical effects as that fetus is growing. Um, small brain size, which is microencephaly. Um, it can change the folds in the eyes so the eyes look um, kind of unusual. Um, the philtrum that's underneath our nose, it's that little groove. It may be totally missing and be smooth. Um, there can be some ear anomalies. There, the lip, upper lip may be extremely thin. There can be some, you know, problems that may make it difficult for your child. Marijuana um, contains um, THC, and this THC. Um, binds to a receptor for a natural neurotransmitter that is called ana, um, anad am, amide. And this neurotransmitter normally fits into the receptor site and um, um, causes you to feel good. It's a, a feel-good trans, neurotransmitter. But what ends up happening is THC binds to the receptors instead and blocks the uh, natural neurotransmitter and influences your short-term memory. It creates a feeling of contentment, so you kind of forget um, what's going on. Um, it'll cause this mild euphoria, um, it may cause alterations in your judgment and motor coordination. Heavy use can actually lead to paranoia and some psychotic symptoms that are um, quite disturbing. Long-term use of marijuana with THC can also lead to brain impairment because, again, what you're doing is you're blocking the, neuro, the, the natural neurotransmitters from being able to do their job, and so your brain becomes... Um, reliant on this THC and uh, it can cause changes to occur in your brain, your memory, and your actions. Okay, we've talked about cocaine uh, a little bit before. That is an alkaloid and it's derived from a plant, um, this urethaloxalum uh, coca. Um, it is formed into a rock-like crystal and it prevents that uptake of dopamine. So again, those that dopamine, that neurotransmitter of dopamine will be taken down to the end of the um, presynaptic cleft, released into the synaptic cleft. These dopamine receptors on the uh, postsynaptic neuron will accept those receptors and, um, and, and it'll help keep you feeling healthy and good and and so on. But if you take cocaine, what ha and normally I should say these neurotransmitters are returned to the neuron through these dopamine transporters. But what ends up happening when you take cocaine, those those transporters become blocked. And when they come blocked, then dopamine, it's still going to be released by these neurotransmitters. These receptors can only work so hard to process so much dopamine at one time. And so they get filled with dopamine and it creates that initial uh, feeling of um, hyperactivity, uh, feeling good, you may be aroused. And, um, and then you may also become addicted to where you want to keep repeating that. Now, the crash phase, there's a crash phase as well in which you use, you know, okay, so 
once the cocaine is out of your system and the dopamine transporters open, those, there's going to be a rush of dopamine back into that neuron. And you're going to have this crash where you've experienced depression and fatigue and, and you may have trouble concentrating. Your sex drive may go down and, uh, you may be irritable and then you're going to, um, possibly want to, uh, take another hit. Um, this can lead to long-term effects, okay? Long-term changes in your brain. Um, binge phases can last for days in which somebody's not sleeping. Um, they might be hyperactive. Um, I know I've had students come in before that haven't slept for three or four days at a time, and they're very jittery and they're hyper. And heaven forbid you correct them on anything because they go crazy, and there is no controlling them, and uh, you don't quite know uh, what their reactions are going to be. It's it's kind of scary. So um, anyway, stay off drugs. It's 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 bad for you neurologically, physiologically, and psychologically. So cocaine can cause some extreme physical dependence. And let me give you an example here because chronic use of drugs like cocaine can reduce the production of dopamine, which reduces your ability to have those natural feel good uh, chemicals. And as a result, users develop this tolerance or this dependence on the drug. So, and then it can lead to overdosing at some point in time. And again, we talked a little bit about long-term brain damage, but let me give you an example. Let's say that you have 10 receptors, okay? And my fingers are going to represent the receptors. Let's say that what happens is you start, um, you've blocked the, the, the um, cocaine has blocked the transporter. So dopamine starts building up and dopamine starts binding to these receptors and sending a, 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 a signal to the next neuron that euphoria that feel good. Now what happens is these receptors become overstimulated. And what happens is they start shutting down one by one. So instead of having 10, you might have seven. And then you maybe take, uh, you know, a hit of cocaine again or whatever you call it. And, um, um, you again are, are releasing too much dopamine and it's being, uh, responding with receptors and these receptors start shutting down. That's where we're seeing down here. We're seeing this decreased dopamine receptors. Then what happens is that sends a signal that says, stop making a mu as much dopamine and your receptor numbers still decrease until where you don't have very many dopamine receptors and you're not making much dopamine. And so your reliance on cocaine to feel good so that whatever dopamine you're getting triggers a, a, a response, then, um, that becomes a problem. And so you start taking more and more and more cocaine, hoping to release more and more dopamine to get that initial effect back. Now, Think about this logically. If your number of receptors have decreased and the amount of dopamine that you're releasing has decreased, what is cocaine going to do for you? Because remember, cocaine blocks the transporter. But if you're not producing very much dopamine and you don't have very many receptors, then are you ever going to get that, that initial feeling that you had the first time? No. Now, some people, um, and this is where ODing becomes especially dangerous too, because um, sometimes people go to rehab or they stop using the drugs and, and uh, your body's a wonderful thing because it will oftentimes heal itself and those receptors will return and dopamine will increase its production and uh, you can start feeling good again naturally. The problem is, is that sometimes people relapse. And the other problem is, is that they remember how much cocaine they were taking towards the end of their addiction. They may not remember how little cocaine it took at the beginning of their addictive cycle. And so they may actually take too much of that cocaine and block all of those uh, transporter centers, produce they're going to produce a ton of dopamine because they've recovered and they have all those receptors back 
and it may uh, cause an overdose to occur, which can lead to seizures, which can lead to cardiac arrest, um, lead to respiratory arrest where your lungs shut down as well. And um, you guys, please, it, I'm serious. It can lead to long-term brain damage. I have some students that I remember from when I first started teaching uh, um, over 25 years ago. And the these same students I see on the streets and I see that they cannot form complete sentences now. And uh, it's just, they can't take care of themselves. So don't be, don't be them. Okay. Take care of yourself. Take care of your brain. All right. This is what um, the brain looks like on the left here, this side over here, before chronic cocaine use. So you can see, how, remember red and yellow, these are the active parts of the brain that are um, picking up stimuli and responding to those stimuli. If you look at the brain on the right, this is after chronic brain use. Do you see very many areas that are colored red? No. And even the areas that are covered yellow are extremely reduced. So brain activity is severely um, um, decreased in somebody who is chronically using cocaine. Okay, heroin is derived from morphine, which is an alkaloid of opium. And opium comes from another type of plant. Uh, heroin binds to natural endorphin receptors and it produces this euphoria or this pain relief and this tranquil uh, type feeling. With repeated use, your body though stops producing natural endorphins. And it's at that point in time that your body develops this tolerance and you need to, because you have lost numbers of receptors again, and your body or the user needs to start taking more. So here's the natural endorphin that's fitting into the receptor side of the receptor. Just so happens that morphine fits into the same site. And when morphine fits into the same site, it's going to block the endorphins from being able to bind to those sites. And um, eventually what will happen is if you're not needing endorphins, those endorphin concentrations are going to decrease. And... Um, this is one of the reasons why it's really hard to get off of some of these drugs because if you deprive your body of morphine and your body's not making any endorphins, then you're going to feel like crap. Excuse my four letter word, but that's really what it comes down to. All right. So after tolerance develops, the user has to take more and more of the drugs to prevent those withdrawal symptoms. And those withdrawal symptoms include tremors, restlessness, uh, their pupils get very dilated and very big. Um, they may have cramping that's occurring. They may perspire profusely. Their blood pressure may increase. Their respiratory rate will increase. Um, but I mean, it's better to go with, through withdrawals than to be um, experiencing the alternative, which is convulsions, respiratory failure, heart failure, death. Okay, so there's a number of club drugs out there. Ecstasy is one of them, and it's MDMA. It is very similar in terms of its chemistry to methamphetamines. It will also or may increase uh, feelings of well-being. Other effects, effects include increased heart rate, um, increased blood pressure, um, muscle tension, your muscles get really tight, and it may cause blurred vision. MDMA can interfere with your ability to regulate your body temperature. It can also cause damage to your liver, your kidneys, your heart. And uh, if you were to chronically use these drugs, you can, again, cause brain damage, uh, damage to your memory centers, and uh, severe depression. So if you look at what's happening here, these um, um, club drugs are blocking the uptake of serotonin, the reuptake. So those serotonin channels, just like in cocaine, they get blocked by um, in this case, ecstasy. And as your body or your presynaptic cells are releasing serotonin into the synaptic cleft, um, they are sending signals to your postsynapse, but 
the drug is blocking the return of that serotonin to the neuron. And as a result, again, this is where that dependency starts, is you have this increase in serotonin here. These um, receptors um, um, are going to work overtime. The number is going to decrease. The serotonin is not going to be returned to the neuron. There's going to be a decrease in production of that serotonin. And now we have somebody who is um, addicted to drugs. And in order to get the same effect, they're going to have to take a lot more. Um, Rufi's. Rufi's is another example of a club drug. And um, it's in the same class of drugs as Valium, which is a sedative. And uh, when you mix a Rufi with alcohol, it can inhibit you to where you are not able to resist attacks, um, for example, sexual assaults. And you may also not remember anything that happened while you were on that drug. Um, you get a type of amnesia um, that you may, you know, go, wow, what happened, you know, um, and you may recognize that you've been raped, but you will have no memory of that. Um, it's kind of nice because um, um, these roofies now, they have been infused with a dye so that when it is put into a solution like your drink, it turns liquid blue because otherwise that drug has no taste, no smell. You would never, ever know uh, or, or have known that it you you were given a roofie, so um, it's kind of nice that pharmacists now um, or whoever's manufacturing these drugs um, now make sure that they are encoded with a dye, right? Okay, uh, ketamine. This is actually a drug that's used by veterinarians as an anesthetic. Um, anesthetic, sorry, um, and it can cause dangerous reductions in heart and respiratory functions. In fact, it can also, it is oftentimes known as the date drug, and it can render a victim unable to move or respond. And it kind of is like takes your brain, puts it somewhere else so that you are detached from reality. Uh, some of the names that this is also called, because you never hear it called by ketamine, um, Special K, Vitamin K, um, Cat Valium, those are the common names for these drugs. It is a clear liquid or off-white powder. Oftentimes it is injected. You can't taste or smell it either, which makes it uh, kind of scary. Okay, methamphetamine is meth or crank. It's a power central nervous system stimulate that causes large amounts of dopamine to be released. And when that large amount of dopamine is released, it's going to cause this initial rush of euphoria. You're going to feel really good. You're going to have lots of energy. You're going to be very alert, have an elevated mood. But after the initial rush, oftentimes what happens is you get really irritable. Um, sometimes you may uh, experience violent behavior. Um, meth is oftentimes made in homemade laboratories, which is really dangerous because it can explode. It can cause fires. Um, it can cause injury to uh, your being. An ingredient found in cold medicine is a component of meth. The ephedrine or pseudoephedrine is the, the drug that's found in these cold medicines. And that's one of the reasons why you can't buy it over the counter anymore. Um, or you have to show your ID when you buy it uh, so that they can verify you're of age. Plus you go into a, a, a bank of people who are buying this drug just to make sure that you're not buying it and using it too much of it. And I guess they have a norm how, how often people buy cold medicine and how much they buy at a time. And if you're outside those norm ranges, you're going to be tagged in the system and, and uh, possibly investigated. So chronic use of meth, as we said, can lead to paranoia, can lead to cardiovascular uh, collapse, can lead to death. Um, if we look at that again, here's a normal um, neuron transmitting the dopamine vesicles. The dopamine gets sent into the dopamine, um, I'm sorry, the synaptic cleft, uh, bonds with the receptor, sends on the action potential, and normally it returns through the dopamine receptors. If you're taking meth, then look at this. Per the purples are the meth. It blocks those transporters 
And as a result, that meth builds up and um, responds to, or the receptors accept that dopamine and then um, send that action potential down the next axon, which makes you feel really, really good. But the problem in again is again, is you experience a decrease in the number of receptors that are available for future reactions. And then the brain starts producing less and less of that dopamine. Bath salts are a, a new illicit drug that oftentimes contains the, a synthetic form of amphetamine, um, such as this really long name and methadrone. And uh, these chemicals inhibit the uptake or reuptake of several neurotransmitters that also cause a euphoric sensation. Um, side effects of bath salts involve severe chest pain, hallucinations, paranoia, violent episodes that can lead to suicide. Um, you may have seen some videos on YouTube of people who are taking bath salts and they um, um, become zombie-like and they are unable to control their muscles and, and they're flailing all over the place and they're hallucinating and um, it's really horrible to watch. All right, so let's talk about some disorders of the brain. Um, Alzheimer's is one of them. It is the most common form of dementia. Signs of Alzheimer's usually appear before the age of 50. And it's a, the people that are experiencing loss um, or lose the ability to remember recent events. That's one of the early signs. Um, abnormal neurons, especially in the hippocampus and the am amygdala, um, create plaques and, and neurofibrillary uh, uh, tangles um, that um, th th these are some of the, th um, the structures that start forming tangles and start forming these odd plaques and proteins in the brain that interfere with the ability to get messages where they're supposed to go. Um, there's been several genes that scientists have been able to identify that can tell you whether you're predisposed or not to getting Alzheimer's. Uh, there is no prevention or cure to getting Alzheimer's. And um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people get it. Parkinson's disease is a horrible, awful disease that results in a loss of motor control. And it typically begins between the ages of 50 and 60 years old. There can be early onset of Parkinson's, and of course you can get it later as well. Um, the characteristics of it include tremors, like shaking, um, muscle rigidity, like they can't move. Um, my aunt um, actually had, uh, she just passed away recently, but she had Parkinson's and uh, she would experience these moments of rigidity where she would stand and we'd be walking somewhere and then she couldn't move. Um, they may experience rigidity in that their eyes freeze open and uh, they may experience tremors or small little uh, stroke-like episodes as a result of Parkinson's. And what causes Parkinson's is the uh, degeneration of dopamine producing neurons. And so dopamine um, levels become really low. You can see there's a reduced level of dopamine. You still have all your receptors, but you're not producing enough dopamine. So that actual potential is not being sent on the way it should. Uh, dopamine cannot be administered because it cannot pass the blood brain barrier. And since it can't pass the blood brain barrier or the BBB, it's not going to have any effect on your nervous system. L-DOPA is a drug that the body can convert to dopamine at least for a little while. And uh, so sometimes they will start giving the patient some L-DOPA um, to kind of make up for the missing dopamine. Um, multiple sclerosis or MS is a common neurological disease that affects young adults. And what happens is, is this is the normal myelin sheath and somebody who has multiple sclerosis, their myelin sheath becomes damaged. And uh, this will affect in the brain the white matter 
um, which is going to start breaking down as well. And as a result, you're not going to be getting those nerve impulses going where they're supposed to be going. It can result in muscle fatigue, muscle weakness, uh, vision problems, uh, tingling and numbness in your limbs. Um, it can take several forms. It can be, MS can be a very mild form to a very severe form. One of my other aunts has MS and uh, it's caused severe muscle weakness. And uh, she has fallen down, I don't know how many times, and broken hundreds of bones over her lifespan here um, due to MS. There's no treatment available, unfortunately. Um, but there are some medications and drugs that can be given to help slow the progression of MS so somebody can live a, a long, healthy life. My aunt was actually diagnosed in her late teens, and she's in her 70s now. Okay, this is an MRI scan um, of a brain that shows the brain of an MSS pa uh, MS patient or somebody with multiple sclerosis. The white areas are where there are um, MS plaques um, that are inflamed and where the white matter in the brain, the myelin, has been destroyed. Remember in the brain, this, this area right here, maybe you can see it, it's a little bit darker blue. That's the white matter. And then this um, lighter blue that we see out here, that's the gray matter. So in here, the white matter is being destroyed or inflamed or irritated in some ways. I know that my aunt, she um, will experience times where the white matter is very inflamed and um, she's bedridden for periods of time until that inflammation settles itself down and she can return back to being a little bit more active. Okay, other disorders of the brain, a stroke. Um, a stroke is a disruption of blood supply, supply in the brain. There's two major forms. There's hemorrhagic strokes and there's ischemic uh, strokes. Um, hemorrhagic strokes are the result of small little arteries that um, are leaking blood into the brain and they're causing these pools of blood in the brain. Um, these ischemic uh, um, strokes are occurring due to a sudden loss of brain or blood supply to that part of the brain. So this one, in, in the first one here, this is where there's some kind of obstruction and you're not getting blood to that particular part of the brain. And in this one, you actually have linkage of those blood vessels in the brain that are causing an accumulation of blood. Um, symptoms depend upon the amount and the area of blood tissue involved and your age, uh, factors on like whether you smoke or not may also influence the likelihood of you having a stroke. Meningitis. We talked a little bit about meninges. We said meninges are covering over our brain. Uh, this is the bone for the skull and then you have three layers of meninges. And uh, these meninges are also filled with cerebral spinal fluid. If you get an infection in the meninges um, that surround the brain and the spinal cord here, it could be caused by bacteria, it could be caused by viruses, and it may spread from wherever the infection is at into other brain and spinal tissue. Um, if you have meningitis, again, that's inflammation of the meninges tissue, it is diagnosed by taking a sample of your cerebral fly, spinal fluid, and they'll usually do like a little spinal tap where they'll insert a needle into your meninges and then remove some cerebral spinal fluid. Um, there is a vaccine available to protect against some of the types of meningitis. Prions, some of you have heard of mad cow disease. Prions are infectious proteins that replicate and accumulate in the blood tissue and they cause these holes to occur in the brain tissue. Um, there's no treatment available and it is fatal. Um, there are, oh, I guess I, well, it must be in my other lecture that I cover it. Uh, Carew is kind of an interesting disease. It is um, um, a disease it, that 
a certain people or cultures of people, um, when they are eating brain tissue of humans and other animals, that is where they are sometimes getting these prions. And then these prions are infecting their brain and it affects their brain function as well. And uh, it will kill them. Um, mad cow disease is very simple, similar to the uh, Kreisfeld Jacob syndrome in which, again, you get these holes in your brain tissue, no treatment available, and it is fatal. All right, so disorders of the spinal cord itself. Um, spinal cord injuries, uh, most of you are familiar with that, um, are often the result of some kind of trauma, a car accident, um, falling off of something. And what happens is the impulses, those action potentials, um, actually stop traveling along the neurons of the spinal cord. And in, or if you remember back in our central nervous system, there is very little to no nerve re regeneration of those neurons in your spinal cord or your brain. So if you damage part of your spinal cord, you may experience permanent paralysis of areas below the site of the injury because you're not going to be getting action potentials to those areas. Um, injury between the th first thoracic vertebrae, which is here, and the lumbar vertebrae, L2, which is here, um, it causes a paralysis of the lower body and the lower legs, okay? Um, and so you're literally from up here down, you are paralyzed. Um, an injury below the neck um, can cause what is called quadriplegia, and that quadriplegia means that your arms and your legs and everything below does not work. So a, an injury between uh, T1 and L2 um, oftentimes results in what is called paraplegia, where you are not able to use two limbs. Anything up in the cervical region on down can cause quadriplegia, where all four limbs are affected and no longer are getting action potentials or nerve impulses and so you're, you're paralyzed. Whoops. All right, disorders of the spinal cord itself. ALS, some of you have heard of ALS. We know that Lou Gehrig uh, had what is called Lou Gehrig's disease. He had ALS. Uh, Stephen Hawking is uh, currently battling Lou Gehrig's disease, which is ALS. This uh, affects the motor nerves of the spinal cord. And so what happens is you're not getting those uh, sensory impulses integrated into your spinal to receive those um, reflexes back. And so your motor neurons from your spinal cord are not functioning. It is incurable. People usually die within five years of diagnosis. Um, and it may um, be multiple causes of nerve cell death. Okay, disorders of the peripheral nervous system, the Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, or GBS. GBS actually causes a demyelinization, again, a breakdown of that myelin sheath along the axon. It uh, probably results from an abnormal immune reaction to either a viral infection or a bacterial infection, and it causes muscle weakness to occur in um, the lower limbs, and then oftentimes it will migrate up and affect the upper limbs. Most of the time people will recover within a year, but in that year it could be a pretty long recovery because oftentimes they are wheelchair bound, um, they're not able to do anything because of uh, the weakness and uh, sometimes pain associated with that. Uh, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease as well. Um, antibodies are reacting against the acetylcholine receptors of your skeletal muscles. And therefore, as a result, if you have um, the antibodies reacting against it, what ends up happening is um, the antibodies, and these green um, structures here are the antibodies, they block the receptors and therefore acetylcholine is not going to be able to bind to these receptors thanks to these antibodies blocking the entrance to those receptors. So if you're not getting acetylcholine, which is important for muscular contractions, 
into your muscles, you are going to experience muscular weakness and uh, it can lead to death. Okay. Um, patients respond well to immunosuppressive drugs and the acetylcholine inhibitors because what the immunosuppressive drugs are going to do is they're going to suppress these antibodies. Um, plasma phoresis can also be used to remove harmful antibodies from the patient's blood. All right, so we have reached the end of our part three of the nervous system and our nervous system unit. Again, if you have any questions, please make sure you reach out, contact me through Canvas, have a great rest of the day or evening, or again, wherever you're at, and I will see you soon. Bye.